Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a talk. And uh, these uh, results of this, these results are basically a uh, joint with Maxim Kansevich. Uh, so to uh, start off, uh, so I want to basically uh, start off with something basic. So let's have function on CN. And uh, I want to just uh, briefly remind you of the Morse lemma. So if you have a function at cn, and let's say uh, this function has a non-degenerate critical point at 0, meaning that the determinant of the Hessian is going to be positive, derivative is 0, uh, then Morse lemma just tells you that you can do a local coordinate transformation for this thing to turn it into a sum of squares. So basically, this thing has some sort of local expression or local normal form that looks like the sum of squares. And so you can try to ask the same question, but instead of allowing these kind of local diffeomorphisms, you instead allow local, only allow local symplectomorphisms. So the setup is more or less the same. But now you have two n dimensional complex space. And again, everything is basically the same as before. And you want to use these kind of local symplectomorphisms to turn this into something that's not quite the sum of squares, but maybe related to it. And so uh, the idea is that you can try to do this, uh, you can do this formally, and uh, there's a result that's called the Birkhoff normal form. Uh, that essentially says that under certain conditions, you can turn this into basically a function or formal power series in terms of uh, sums of squares. So this goes as follows. You can expand h near 0 and obtain a formal power series that has uh, sort of this quadratic term, and then it has some higher degree stuff. And then this is degree 2. And so then uh, suppose that uh, just by using these kind of symplectic uh, changes of coordinates, you can turn the quadratic part into the sum of squares. So, so into this kind of thing, and then uh, this is say that I call these sums of squares HIs. So this is, uh, sorry? What is the condition on H? What was structure? Uh, what is the condition on H? Uh, so basically I want uh, the value of H is 0 to be 0. I want the derivative to vanish, and I want the sort of the Hessian matrix to to be. Oh, so, it's, but, but it's like, so it's any function. Uh, yes, yes, it's any it's any function. Yeah. So this is this is here. This is yeah. This is any function. This is symplectic. I didn't really write the symplectic form, but it's sort of the usual one. And you preserve, preserve this. Yeah. So I'm looking at formal transformations that preserve the symplectic form. 
Does H have a, a compatibility condition with simplex before? Well, no, it's just any fun. No, it's just, it's just anything, yeah. So this is by formal, or I guess a local, um, like oh, some plug of morphisms. Let's see. Yeah. So this has um, this is like a general form where for quadratic forms under these kind of transformations, but uh, I want it to look like this specifically. And uh, so in this case, um, the so another assumption that I need is that these uh, AIs, these coefficients, are linearly dependent uh, over Q. So this and AI and so in this case there's going to be a formal symplectomorphism, so it's just going to be a formal Automorphism of these Poisson algebras. Uh, such that this transforms my function into basically something that depends on just these sums of squares. And here, this is just going to be, again, some power series. Like this. And so you have this. Three boards. That's unexpected. Right, so you have this kind of uh, normal form, which is, I believe, unique up to sine. And so uh, what I want to do next is to talk about the same kind of normal form, but sort of in the quantum case. So in the case where I'm looking at uh, differential operators um, instead of so I'm a little bit confused. So is this last line is some statement saying you always can you can always yes. find this? Yes. So yeah, maybe this is unclear. So there exists uh, there exists this kind of automorphism such that um, you can write down H. Yeah. Okay. So. There is a corresponding quantum statement and so here I'm going to uh, replace H with HQ which is uh, going to be something non-commutative or something in a non-commutative algebra. this and here um, the Q's are sort of the standard commutative variables and the P's are uh, these differentiation operators like this. So sort of have the standard uh, commutation relation. on these things. And so once again, I want to have some sort of conditions on this. So basically I want, um, let's say that I want zero to be, I can take this, um, set h bar equal to zero and get sort of the classical version here. And I want zero to once again be this kind of non-degenerate critical point. And um, once again, the same kind of 
condition, you can uh, try to transform this using automorphisms of this algebra. Um, so it looks like something quadratic. This and I want to transform this something quadratic into the same kind of thing. Uh, this is a square. Once again, sums of squares. Like this. And once again, these are linearly independent. Over Q. And once again, you can get the same kind of statement, meaning that there is a normal form that you can transform the HQ into. So there exists this um, isomorphism of this algebra. that turns HQ into, and uh, again, let me call these things, uh, have HIs, so let's do HQIs. So you can transform it, and this is, again, some formal power series. Like this. And uh, yeah, so uh, you can do this. I'm doing everything over the complex numbers, but there's um, an analog over the real numbers. If you start off with this kind of um, quantum function or quantum Hamiltonian um, that had real coefficients, you end up with uh, a normal form that has real coefficients. So um, all of this can be done with real or complex numbers. And sort of the idea is that uh, by using this normal form, you can get um, or you can say something about uh, spectra of uh, these kind of differential operators in some situations. So let me talk about that next. Uh, but the idea is that essentially since you can express everything in terms of the sums of squares, then you can express spectra for these kinds of um, operators in terms of spectra for, the, uh, for this thing, which is just a um, quantum harmonic oscillator. So So we can compute. Spectra for HQ in terms of the spectrum or spectra for this uh, kind of this kind of thing. So this is just p squared plus q squared over 2. And so this is something that's known. You have, uh, so this is um, just given as something known. It's discrete. And it looks 
let's say k, just like this. And so, AI yeah, can be positive for this reference to be defined. Uh, I think that they they would well. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure if it if it matters. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think what you don't want is you don't want the sign of p squared and q squared to be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, want to essentially do sort of the naive thing, which is to take this to plug it into FQ, and then that would give me sort of the spectrum or the eigenvalues, rather, uh, of HQ. Um, and uh, there's actually that is true in some cases where you have a certain kind of operator acting on Hilbert space. So you can say all of these uh, things um, and make a statement that is actually uh, fully correct. So there's a result due to Sostrand. Um, that says that if you have a specific type of HQ, so this is going to be uh, not H squared. Uh, again, this kind of very specific operator where this is uh, the Laplacian and this thing is a polynomial. And then under a bunch of conditions, including one that basically says this thing has one critical point and it's a non-degenerate critical point. Um, but yeah, so under a bunch of conditions, the asymptotic expansions for the eigenvalues of this thing are going to be exactly the ones that you would expect by plugging in uh, to the Birkhoff normal form. So. certain conditions on V. And the eigenvalues. Of this HQ acting again on, say, space of L2 functions or something like that. And given just by plugging in uh, let's say this. So uh, sort of the idea now is that uh, instead of trying to compute these eigenvalues um, in some sort of analytic way, you do it algebraically by trying to turn uh, your operator just as something that lives in this kind of algebra into uh, this normal form. Yeah. Alex, can I can ask you a question? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's uh, before you wanted all the like each direction to have a different coefficient, right? The AI is also linearly independent over Q. Yeah. But it seems like here they're all uh, they're all one, right? They're all like uh, H bar over two. Well, okay. So firstly, this is like a specific like like application of this. So this is when you get like the real, the sort of the, the actual like answer. I see. But the, the normal form exists for, like independently. I see. I, I guess my question is, are these conditions on V of the same nature, like non-resonant in some way or? Uh, 
Uh, yes, yes, so you do have the non-resonant condition, yeah. So the non-resonant meaning that the A's are linearly independent, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but there's, there's more to that. I just don't want to write all of them out. But yeah, there's, that's, that's one of them. Okay, so I want to be able to do this algebraically or algebraic geometrically, I guess. And uh, so the idea uh, there is to sort of look at this algebra and think of it as, well, more or less um, deformation quantization of a symplectic manifold, or at least locally. So that means I'm looking at this um, sheaf of uh, series of coefficients and functions on c to the 2n with star product. So Uh, you essentially take this uh, sheaf of functions, and then you introduce a non-commutative product that you can give in terms of um, by differential operators. So for the specific Moyal product here, I could just write out the first few terms. Uh, but this thing modulo um, h bar is just going to give you the commutative product and if you look at the commutator for this product and again take it modulo the right thing um, so divide it out by h bar and then modulo h bar uh, you end up with the Poisson bracket I realize that all of these are denoted by Qs, even though I had Ps and Qs previously. But um, yeah, some of these might be Ps. Essentially, you get each one of these things by taking the right uh, power of the standard Poisson bivector field corresponding to the symplectic form on C to the 2n. So you have like a. this thing, and then you take powers of this to get each, um, each one of these sum ends. So, so there's, there's no k? Uh, did I not? One of these is a j. This is a j. Thank you. That's just my uh, terrible handwriting. Yeah, so that's, uh, there is a j. There is a j. Right. So now the idea is, again, uh, as I mentioned before, to look at this A as some kind of uh, formal version of this. Um, you can say this more precisely. You can uh, take like uh, this kind of uh, sheaf with this multiplication, sheaf of non-commutative algebras. You can uh, look at the stock, take the formal completion, and then you get something like that. But yeah, so the idea is to Uh, quantize um, homomorphic symplectic manifold together with a function, and that would give you the HQ.
plus function. Um, and in fact, um, possibly even better idea. Uh, if you look at uh, the, well, I already erased it, but you can sort of see it here as well. Uh, you can look at this uh, HQIs, or just the HIs, basically the sum of squares, and those end up Poisson commuting with each other and also Poisson commuting with uh, the H. So that sort of suggests that maybe instead of looking for just uh, quantization of a function, and a uh, symplectic manifold, you might be looking for a quantization of an integrable system, since you have some number of these Poisson commuting uh, functions. So, uh, in the case that I'm going to be talking about, which is the case when the dimension of x is equal to 1, there's not really a difference. So quantize integral system, we have H and HIs. Right, so um, this is Uh, what I want to be doing, so quantizing these kinds of things. And so firstly, the objects that I'm going to be talking about aren't going to be uh, quite integrable systems. They're going to be uh, complex Lagrangian vibrations. So I just require my fibers to be Lagrangians of manifolds instead of for them to actually be tori. So say quantize A complex of Grangian vibrations. So I have quantization, want to do quantization for something like this. So X is holomorphic symplectic. And then, yeah, so that means dimension is 2n. And then uh, have a holomorphic base b. And then you have this pi, which is a surjective thing, a surjective morphism, and the generic fibers of the Rajan sub manifold. And so some fibers are bad. So in some places, the fibers are going to be singular. Uh, you can try to throw out those singular points. So you can define this. This is where pi is a submersion. And so you throw out the images at those points at the base. And now uh, you can get something like this, where the fibers actually are Lagrangian. And this is going to be some sort of locally trivial Lagrangian vibration. So I want to talk about quantizing this. And the quantization of this kind of thing is just going to be a quantization of x in terms of deformation quantization, and then a quantization of the uh, morphism pi.
So in terms of quantization, this consists of two things. So one is quantization of the Shiva functions on x. And again, that just means you have some sort of um, sheaf of associative algebras that's going to be flat over power series in a formal parameter h bar. And then you can get back the original functions by setting h bar to 0. And finally, this thing is going to locally look like a deformation quantization of x. So locally isomorphic to this with a star product. So basically locally isomorphic to this with the Lyell star product. And so that's what a quantization of the sheaf of functions on the total spaces. And then to add in quantization of uh, the morphism or the mapping pi, I just want to essentially have an injective morphism that takes the functions on the base and embeds them as a commutative or hue of commutative cell algebras. And I'll do it like this so that there's some trivial dependence on h bar. So you have this kind of injective morphism. And the main sort of uh, operative example that I'm going to be referring to in uh, the rest of this talk is the case where x is c squared and b is just c. And then uh, h, or not h, pi is just going to be the sort of uh, sum of squares that's been showing up. So main example. C and then pi is, I'll call this each knot from now on. And uh, in fact, the thing I want to do is uh, do a change of coordinates to change the sum of squares into actually a product uh, like this. Uh, this is slightly easier to work with. So what I'm looking at is uh, this function. And so the quantization is, is pretty simple. It's just you get the standard Mayal quantization of um, the functions on c squared. So it looks like this. And then uh, I'm just going to take my um, pullback of functions on the base and uh, put it in here as uh, you have functions, let's say, on the base that look like this. I'm going to send this to f of x, y in here. So this is something that lives here. 
Um, so yeah, sort of what you might expect if you just look at this in terms of uh, the commutative case, where you just write out what this morphism does on uh, the corresponding algebras of functions. So um, this is going to be the main example, and it's going to be sort of the main local model for how quantizations of these uh, kinds of um, locally trivial Lagrangian vibrations or complex Lagrangian vibrations work in the case where the dimension is 2. So uh, now I want to get back to this Birkhoff neural form and sort of talk about it, restate it uh, in terms of um, that's sort of more amenable, I guess, or easier to quantize. Considering f are only polynomials for now. Uh, I mean, it could be uh, just uh, any holomorphic functions. Any holomorphic functions, I see. So like yeah. X and y are like non-commuting. Uh, so in this case, um, x y is is commutes with itself. I mean, they're non-commuting in the sense of the star product. Yeah. The star product. Yeah. Um, so what I'm saying is that if you write out functions that are functions of x y or x x like times y in sort of the I guess the commutative sense, mm -hmm. then, then if you multiply those functions together with star, using the star product, you get some sort of algebra of commutative functions. So they commute with each other. Um, you want this to be true for x, y minus lambda for any lambda? Uh, I want. I mean, this is kind of tautological. <coughs> oh, you mean about the, if you're talking about. Uh, or you're only looking over, over, over zero? Yeah, right now, right now everything, is, everything is over zero, yeah. So the point is that this local model gives the behavior for like an arbitrary, like complex um, Lagrangian duration of dimension two over like any point. You just identify everything, so it's near zero. Yeah. So um, so again, if you look at the um, Birkhoff normal form. You can sort of look at the Birkhoff normal form theorem in a different way. So you have, um, let's say, a complex Lagrangian vibration. Uh, where the dimension of x is 2 and the base is specifically a line. And then um, I have a non-degenerate critical point of h, and you look at it as a function, and then the corresponding critical value I'll denote by B naught. And so you can look at this Birkhoff normal form as a kind of equivalence of um, germs of these complex Lagrangian vibrations. Uh, near the critical point. So something like this. And the equivalence is given in terms of this commutative diagram, where on the one side you have something in general, and on the other side you have the model example, which is c squared I'm mapping to c. H naught is again sum of squares, and um, this is the transformation. So this is still the commutative case, but it's the equivalent of, of uh, psi q in the non-commutative case.
and the bottom part of this. is given by the Birkhoff normal form. So it looks like this. And so you could do the same kind of thing in a non-commutative case. Uh, you can write this diagram in the non-commutative case as well. So let me just quickly do that. But uh, essentially, I am also going to be comparing my quantization, which is going to be on this side, with the local model, which is going to be given uh, by the example over there. So for the quantum Birkhoff normal form, same sort of setup. Um, so I'm not going to rewrite this, but it's the same setup over here. and. Um, I have some sort of quantization of this. So have um, something given by my quantization. of h on the one side, and then on the other side I have the quantization of c squared. Let me add these in. And so this is the model example. And what the quantum Birkhoff normal form says is that these two are equivalent. So that there are these horizontal arrows. So again, this is. Let me just write that this is going to be given by FQ. So I'm a little confused about notation. In the bottom is the H inverse. I, I guess yeah. you can explain what that is. Uh, yeah. So. Um, Yeah, so it's when I was doing um, the quantization, I was doing pi inverse, so I was just doing sort of the pullback of the sheaf of functions so that they're on the same space. Uh, but yeah, in general, I'm just trying to pick a commutative algebra in here that's uh, going to consist of functions in the base. Um, and so this is. The bottom row is a sheaf of commutative algebra. Yeah, so both of these are sheaves of commutative algebra, so there should actually be. This is all. These are all near the critical values. So this is, um, yeah, so these are all near critical points, critical values. Uh, so this equivalence is only local. Um, yeah. Right, so I'm sort of uh, slowly um, trying to introduce more and more geometry into this uh, question of finding these Birkhoff normal forms. So uh, one more uh, thing. Uh, that I want to introduce uh, that would help with this is uh, going to be uh, this idea of a canonical coordinate. So for uh, doing this in the commutative case, again, h is the same as before. Um, x naught is the same as before. Everything is the same. 
uh, I can introduce a function canonical coordinate that's just going to be defined in the following way that I'll explain. So locally, when I look at my function h, you have a fiber that looks like this locally. And there is this vanishing cycle. So this is going to be near uh, the critical value. The fibers look like this. There's going to be some sort of a vanishing cycle that contracts to a point uh, when you get closer and closer to B0. And what I want to do is take a relative cycle that sort of um, has this vanishing cycle as a boundary. And that's going to be what I'm calling a DB vanishing. So in each fiber, I take the vanishing cycle, I sort of cover it up with like a, like a film, something like that, like a thin film. And then I'm going to integrate my two form over this. And you can show that this is going to give you a well-defined function on some punctured neighborhood near the critical value of h. So this lives b naught. This lives somewhere here. And in fact, you can uh, take a limit and extend this to the entire neighborhood. This is b naught. This is b. Like this. And so this is relevant to the Birkhoff normal form um, in the sense that in order to get the Birkhoff normal form, it is actually uh, enough to find a transformation between the canonical coordinate and the standard coordinate on uh, this small neighborhood of the critical value. So this is again sort of a fact that if I take my canonical coordinate uh, for my function h, uh, then under this equivalence, it gets taken to the corresponding one for uh, the sum of squares. And the one for the sum of squares can be directly computed, and it's almost the same up to like a um, multiplication by constant, almost the same as the standard coordinate on the line. So that means if I'm interested in figuring out uh, what f is, it's enough to take the standard coordinate on uh, the line over here near b0 and transform it into the canonical coordinate to get this out. So this implies you need to find coordinate change. Like this. And so uh, the idea is that in the quantum case, this is, you can sort of try to do the same thing. Um, you can try to reduce the uh, problem of trying to find some sort of coordinate change in some non-commutative algebra to trying to find a coordinate change in the commutative algebra on the base. And so let me say how to do that. Mm -hmm.
So when I'm talking about the quantization of this complex Lagrangian vibration, I'm talking about something that's very algebraic. Uh, I want to make it more geometric, since the definition of this canonical coordinate is geometric. Um, and in order to do that, I want to introduce one more idea. And that is that there's a correspondence between quantizations of these complex Lagrangian vibrations and formal deformations. So this goes back to Agarai and von Straten. So there's a correspondence where on the one side you have these quantizations. And this is true in the multi-dimensional case, so that's why I'm writing pi. Like this. So quantizations on the one side and formal deformations meaning that I have some formal parameter, but the deformations are commutative. So I'm deforming um, my symplectic manifold and the morphism, but I'm not deforming the base. The base stays the same. So there's one-to-one um, -one correspondence. And uh, part of this correspondence is sort of what lets you transform some geometric things like this canonical coordinate from the side of formal deformations uh, and bring it over to the side of quantizations. So uh, let me just say that so we can define this canonical coordinate essentially on the side of deformations. in more or less the same way as it did in the classical case, which is in terms of this integral. And then once again, the question of sort of transforming the standard coordinate on the line into this canonical coordinate is what's going to give you sort of the Birkhoff normal form on this side. And then because of this correspondence, you also get the Birkhoff normal form on this side, which happens to be the quantum one. So um, to say this a little bit more precisely, I firstly want to go back to this main example and say or describe what the deformation that corresponds to it is going to be over here. So. So the deformation corresponding to the main example that's going to be given, I'm going to give it in terms of uh, gluing two pieces. So um, okay, I actually wrote this incorrectly. So the important thing is that uh, this correspondence does work, but it only works if you throw out the bad points. That's actually very important. Um, and I should have said that. So this correspondence is actually only true if you throw out all the places where the fibers are singular. Um, otherwise, uh, this gets yeah, this this gets more complicated, and and it's not true. Right. So when I say deformation of main example, what I'm actually looking for is a deformation of the main example restricted to the punctured c squared instead of the whole c squared. So here, I'm going to restrict this to c squared punctured at 0, which is the bad point, because that's where you get the singular fiber. And then, uh, once again, this is xy. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to glue this a deformation out of two pieces 
that both look like C cross C star. And so C cross C star is some sort of affine, um, affine open set inside of C squared. Uh, so that's not going to deform at all. But the gluing map is going to be responsible for sort of the uh, non-trivial deformation. And so this is going to have coordinates x1, y1 for this u1. And here x1 is not equal to 0. And then y1 is arbitrary. Here it's x2 is arbitrary and y2 is not equal to 0, like this. And so you can get a deformation of this uh, total thing uh, by essentially gluing together uh, these two neighborhoods via uh, this identification. sort of see that this preserves uh, the mapping. So if you take the product of these two things, you still get x1, y1. Um, and so this is, uh, this is what I'm going to say. I'm, I'm about to say it, yeah. Um, so generally, you get a deformation regardless of what phi is. But for this specific example, phi is very specific. Um, and here, phi is to be given in terms of the series. Which is going to look like this. Hopefully I'm, this is correct. And the uh, B to K here, uh, these are Bernoulli numbers. So uh, there is uh, this, let me write this out as something dependent on T and H bar. It's defined like this. Is T equal to X hand fly? Uh, sorry? Is T still equal to X hand fly? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, t is t is uh, x times y. Yeah. So uh, you get this uh, interesting interesting series if you try to figure out what this uh, thing is supposed to be. And uh, finally, um, I'm not sure how much time I have. Do I have like five more minutes, or I don't know how accurate that clock is. Okay. Um, well. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't need too much time, but I, I just want to say um, one more thing, or one more important thing. Um, and so the point is somehow that um, in this case, so in this case, you can compute out So for this specific formal deformation, you can compute out, once again, get a similar relationship between uh, sort of the canonical coordinate and the canonical coordinate in the model example, which tells you what the uh, quantum Birkhoff neural form is going to be. So this is essentially going to be a change of coordinates. And actually, this canonical coordinate in this example here um, ends up just being the same one as in the classical case. You can um, essentially get the quantum Birkhoff neural form by transforming from one canonical coordinate uh, to the standard coordinate near uh, the critical point. And so um, let me
uh, just say that one last thing I was going to say. So you can make this entire thing even more geometric. And you can do this in the following way. So a variation, I'm talking about variation of Hodge structures. Um, so once again, I have this example of my complex Lagrangian fibration, and then I'm going to say that this thing has some number of critical points with critical values b1 through bn. And all of them come from the critical points, let's say x1 through xn. And let's say that all of these are non-degenerate. And so you can do this, and you can get a section of a certain bundle out of this. And I'll explain what all of these things mean. So B0 is, again, as before, it's just going to be this minus all of the critical values. And then this thing, CB, is going to be just the fiber over B, so it's sort of the generic fiber. And finally, the way that this is defined is in terms of an integral. So this is essentially just going to be something that takes a cycle in homology and corresponds to it or sends it to a one form on the line. So it looks like this. And so you can do this. And uh, you can do this in the classical case. But you can also do this in sort of the deformation case. So. Also possible for deformations. And so what that means is, again, there's going to be something here. So deformation of a complex Lagrangian fibration. And this is going to be giving me the same kind of thing, but now it's going to be a formal power series in h-bar. Like this. And so finally, um, the one last thing that I want to say is that this section is given in terms of these periods, so in terms of these integrals, and uh, the canonical coordinate is also given in terms of some integrals. And so the point is that these are related to each other. So you can encode uh, something about the canonical coordinate, which is in turn related to the Birkhoff normal form in terms of this section. So here, alpha is series that starts off with alpha naught, uh, but uh, somehow if you take alpha and you do an integral with respect to the vanishing cycle, uh, then what you're going to end up with is going to be the one form that corresponds to the canonical coordinate as long as you do this locally. And so the question of trying to find this section alpha in some way is uh, related 
the question of trying to somehow compute this canonical coordinate. So if you're able to write this down in terms of your parameter near some critical point, then you should be able to also express this in terms of this parameter, which gives you the derivative of uh, the Birkhoff normal form or the quantum Birkhoff normal form, depending on whether you're doing things in the classical case or in terms of in this deformed case. Yeah, so I think that's actually all I'm going to say. Okay. Well, thank you, Alex. We have time for maybe two questions. Yeah, sorry, that took too long. Uh, so, so this canonical query that you construct, does it, um, is it analytic in the variables, or do you need to take a log of t? Uh, the canonical coordinate is going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be analytic, but I mean, it only exists in like a small enough neighborhood. Um, but it yeah. is, so, so like if you go around, it doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the other, the other, uh, the other period is the one that, that, that changes. The one, that's the, the other one is the one that gets, that has the log. Yeah, maybe I have a question too, yeah. which is, uh, you told us this formula for phi, yeah. but uh, somehow, uh, how, how do you figure out this phi? Is there some consistency condition that you plug these transformations in and you get it? Or, uh? Uh, yeah, so the idea is that you, this correspondence between deformations and quantizations, uh, you can sort of state it more explicitly in terms of like, um, you're taking isomorphisms of like, either like, the, the quantum sheaves or sheaves of functions on the intersections. Mm -hmm. And so you can explicitly write down what it's gonna be, like the functions here, functions here, and how you transform one into the other. Um, that transformation is the same in the deformation case and the quantum case. And uh, because you know what the quantum case is explicitly, you can compute out what uh, the transformation is gonna be and that's where this function shows up. Okay. Or that's where the series shows up. Okay, there's no more questions. I think I was the end.